I'm a philosopher. Uh, and if any of you are still paying attention, uh, I found philosophy and what, what we do most of the time kind of uh, boring and tedious and abstract and unimportant. And about 10 years ago, I decided to start doing things more in, um, you know, for the public good. And I wrote professional articles on tolerance. And I found out about 10 years ago that uh, articles on top, sorry, that articles written in academic journals are read on average by 1.43 people. Uh, and I wrote 10 of these, so maybe 14.3 or 30 or whatever, uh, 17 or however that works out, people read mine. And take that 1.3, subtract my mother, who always looked at mine, and that means only 0.3 people ever read anything that I wrote. And, uh, and as you look around the world today, and I was, uh, maybe, I, I guess I was a little shocked to see that uh, religious persecution around the world is on the rise. And I, I'm not shocked to see that in the United States it's gotten worse. Uh, of course, we all know that it's gotten worse. It's just right out there now in front of our, uh, our noses for all of us to see. Uh, but I was, uh, when I initially got interested in this, I was working in China. And China has gotten dramatically worse. You can't believe how bad things are in China, for example. For the Uyghur Muslims in the far uh, uh, west of China, they're, they're sent like they were in the 60s to re-education camps. And there's, there's well over a million Muslims in re-education camps in China. And what it means is they are beating the crap out of them until they stop being Muslims. That's what they're doing in China right now. And we know it goes on in, uh, in the United States. Uh, uh, Anti-Semitism is on the rise. Islamophobia is on the rise. Um, fear of Muslims around the world is on the rise. Muslims fear Muslims. There are studies that have been done with Muslims raised in the United States, and young Muslims fear Muslims. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And I, I, I wrote a book. I have a card based on my book. I want to impress you with the book is a cool cover, isn't it? Abraham's Children, uh, Liberty and Tolerance in an Age of Religious Conflict. I just want to impress you a little bit more. Yale University Press published it. Yale University Press, cool, huh? And, but no one bought it. So anyway, <laughs> Yale, you heard it, Yale. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Carter wrote for the book, um, former President uh, Carter, and Abdurrahman Wahid, the first democratically elected president of uh, Indonesia, wrote a chapter. Best chapter in the book. Not that anyone will read it, but uh, for anyone who does, it's a really powerful chapter. Uh, last January, it was translated into Arabic and published in Egypt and sold out in three days at the Cairo Book Fair. I mention that because I think uh, as I work against Islamophobia, we need to know that Muslims around the world desperately fear the rise of radicalism in Islam. Muslims want peace, and we need to know that. One way that I, uh, so I have my phone here. I'd like everyone else to put theirs away. I saw you using theirs, young fella. Um, I take selfies wherever I go in Muslim-majority countries. I have large Muslim audiences. They tend to look different from me, uh, and I post on Facebook. I have a web page based on Abraham's children, 20,000 followers. And I, I mostly post good news about Muslims, Christians, and Jews, since the news only posts bad news about Muslims, Christians, and Jews, usually bad news about Muslims. If somebody happens to have brown skin and happens to be from uh, uh, Iran or Iraq or something, and they do something, it's because they were Muslim. If they're American and they're white and they do something, it's because they're crazy. Uh, it's always because somebody, uh, uh, sorry, it's, uh, if a Muslim does something bad, it's always because they're a Muslim. If a white person does something that's bad, it's always because they're crazy. Um, so I try to post good news. We, want to over, we need to overcome, I, I don't even know how to do it, the torrent, the torrent of bad news about Muslims is uh, awful. And I say it's a torrent of bad news, 99.9% .9 of Muslims around the world want peace, but the only thing that gets reported is the bad news. I can tell you a story about that. I think there's a reason why we only hear bad news. 
Um, and there's a reason why only bad news, news is reported. Um, anyway, I do one small part to try to overcome people's views. I write, I write blogs against Islamophobia. Uh, I, ask, I give these talks that I'm going to give now. I give these talks everywhere I go in the Middle East. Uh, and uh, I gave one in Turkey last March, and 250 people came to hear me talk about peace and compassion. Muslims want peace. Uh, if you take nothing else from that, take this. But I take selfies of my audience to let people see that not all Muslims are terrorists. So if you don't mind, could everyone sort of stand up quickly? Let's take a quick selfie here. You're all going to be on Facebook, by the way. Here we go. One, two, three. Is there, can you get in over there? There we go. And I definitely want pictures with you two because you are <laughs> the best. Can we get a selfie here really quickly? Can I ask the royal father and mother to stand up a sec? Okay, someone can snap us. Can you give us? You, can you take our photograph? Okay. Yeah, can you get me one? Can we get one more? Thank you. I, I, I live in Grand Rapids, Michigan, which I'm pretty sure means nothing to almost nobody in this audience. I, I'm pretty sure New Yorkers aren't even quite sure where Michigan is. You know, it's out there somewhere. Uh, the nice thing about Michigan, anyone in Michigan can do this. We can show where we live with our hand. This is Michigan. Okay, and you know we have lakes around it? This is Michigan. You can't do New York with your hand, can you? See, this is Michigan, right? So this is Michigan. And we have an upper peninsula, but they don't count only. And I can show it. We can all point to where we live on our hand. Grand Rapids is right here. We actually live in a very ethnically diverse place. People think uh, Michigan is only, uh, the mid and the Midwest maybe is only white Christians. Um, I work for an interfaith institute, and we have uh, uh, three Jewish temples in town that are part of our interfaith institute. We have four mosques in town that are active in our inter interfaith institute, and we all do a lot of things together. I, I find that um, lots of times we can come together in, and be in groups like this. We, we don't actually do things together. We sit with people who are like us. Um, we have a tendency to be with people who are uh, like in our tribe. And uh, who is the, the woman who is trying to get all of you to go around and, and talk to somebody? Uh, you can even go to a really diverse university, and maybe Mercy, Mercy is really diverse. Maybe there are people from all over the world uh, at Mercy University. But then you look over, and this is true at my university, we have 24,000 students. We probably have 100 from Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, sadly, all the Saudi Arabians eat together, and nobody gets to take advantage of getting to know someone from another part of the world. And I, I actually I think a lot of the Christians eat together. I think a lot of the Jews eat together. Um, and we don't end up breaking down barriers that need to be broken down. And she's asked that you uh, eat together or uh, talk to each other. I, the most ethnically diverse thing that I do is play soccer. And I, I play with people from uh, Turkey. Uh, I play with lost boys from Sudan. I play with Brazilians, Germans, Americans. Not very many. There are only like two of us Americans um, who are playing. There are people from all over the world. And there are people from all over the world here. If you're not from the US, will you quick put your hand up? If you're not from the US, where are you from? Netherlands. Netherlands. Uh -huh. Oh, there's a lot of Netherlands people in West Michigan, by the way. Yes, loaded with uh, Dutch people. Sorry, Afghanistan, Netherlands, Slovakia, Israel. We live here now. Okay. Uganda. Where else? You're from somewhere else. I know that. Ah. What he said. Where are you from? Where are you from? Jamaica. Jamaica. Sorry. Okay. Good. Are you a student here? Okay. Brooklyn, okay. <laughs> you came a long ways, thanks. All right, all right, you gotta, can you quick, oh, I gotta change out? I'm good. All right. So I wrote Abraham's Children on Liberty and Tolerance 
And um, as I said, nobody bought the book. Uh, and I, I become really concerned that I, I'm, I'm a, again, I said I'm a philosopher. I wrote a lot of academic things. Um, I'm really concerned that academics aren't good at communicating to ordinary human beings, uh, like mo almost all the rest of the world. And so I, I decided to, to do a simpler book um, aimed at the Twitter generation, uh, which is you folks. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like let all of you older people into the Twitter generation. Can you let us feel young for just a sec? Uh, we're in the Twitter generation now, right? I actually, I don't tweet, but somebody tweets for me, which is close enough, I guess. Uh, so it's for, it's for people who have shorter attention spans, who are used to 150 characters. The book doesn't have 150 character chapters. The chapters are each three to five pages long. And I asked my Muslim and Jewish co-authors if they would, um, instead of arguing, which is what I love to argue. I'm a philosopher. This is what we do. I love to argue. I, I can make arguments. I love them. My wife doesn't love them so much. Uh, and she's been telling me for a long time that people don't really respond to arguments. And it took me like 30 years, but I learned that she doesn't respond to arguments. Uh, but I tried, I tried, and tried, and tried. But you know what? People don't like to be argued with. You know if, uh, if what's your name? Wally. Wally. So you know if Wally holds, so suppose Wally uh, is a climate change denier, and I think human beings cause climate change. If I go to Wally and I give him really good arguments, you know what's going to happen to him? And not just Wally, but everybody, if someone gives you an argument against something that you hold, that's you hold deeply, you become more extreme and more certain. People get more dogmatic, more certain, if you present evidence or arguments against their views. None of us likes evidence or arguments against our views. Um, what does change people is meeting people. Where did you say you were from? Pakistan. Pakistan. Nice to meet you. I'm Kelly. Okay, nice to meet you. I'm going to Pakistan in uh, July. Let's. Oh, that's great. Okay. Okay, me too. What does change people is meeting people. And, and not just meeting people. It's not so great just to meet people. Uh, you have to meet people and you have to listen to their stories. Um, and so I, I ask people to write stories, my co-authors to write stories. Um, they have to make a point. The stories all make a point. Every chapter makes a point. Uh, it makes a theological point. Every chapter makes some theological point about Islam, about Christianity, about Judaism, some theological point in favor of compassion, uh, liberty, and peace. Every chapter has to make a point. But you can't argue for it. Um, and I got two really cool co-authors. So I became cool by reflection. And my Muslim co-author is the coolest. And some of you may know, maybe you know this, my, uh, Aziz Abu Sara is his name. And Aziz is famous now because last year, about just about a year ago, he ran for mayor of Jerusalem. And he's famous because Aziz is Palestinian, and um, Palestinians can't become mayor. Um, they're not allowed. It's not part of the Constitution. And Aziz's goal wasn't really to become mayor. Aziz's goal was to improve human rights for Palestinians in Israel and to call attention to that. Um, and just to let you know how, um, how social issues are fraught with peril in Israel, Aziz re received threats from both sides, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, nobody liked what he did. And he ended up having to drop out. He almost had a nervous breakdown, breakdown I think, uh, after running for mayor. Aziz has won two or three peace prizes. Uh, he's a National Geographic explorer which means uh, you know, James Cameron, the director of the Titanic, he's a National Geographic Explorer. So Aziz gets to go to National Geographic Explorer meetings and hang out with James Cameron and all these other cool people who want to explore. Aziz is a cool guy. Uh, and yet he came from um, well, a more modest background, one where you would not expect that Aziz would be uh, now a famous Palestinian peace worker. I'm going to read a little bit of what he 
uh, wrote. And this will be the first chapter. And, um, and you'll see what he faced. Uh, he writes here about, at the, and this is the, from chapter 1. I'm going to read a little bit from chapter 1, from each one. Aziz writes in chapter 1 um, in 1988, so that was 31 years ago. And Aziz is about 38 or 39, maybe he's 40. So he's 7 or 8 years old. And he was bored, and he lived in uh, Bethany, which is a Palestinian village just outside of Jerusalem. And he got together with uh, a couple of his friends. And uh, there, there's no parks in Bethany. There's no community centers. Um, there wasn't much for any kid to do except go out you know, and make a little trouble. So he joined with some kids in the neighborhood. And he uh, went out and got up on a hillside or above a bridge or something. And then they would throw stones at cars that were passing on the route. And you know, someone might hit. They'd get all excited. Uh, they'd each claim that they were the ones that hit the car. He talks about getting caught um, and about uh, his parents' reaction to it. So it starts off with um, talking about this kind of innocence of youth. That's the start. And then, and then we read this. In spite of my re very real fears, I was emboldened by the confidence of youth. I thought I was ine uh, invincible. And then we read this. Each year during Ramadan, my dad would wake us before sunrise to drink water and eat before the start of the day's fast. One morning, my dad woke us up around 4 o'clock. My brothers and I were tired and grumpy. After eating and drinking, we shuffled back to bed. I was 9 and shared a twin bed with my brother, Taysir, who was 18. It was late spring, and the birds were starting to sing as the sky turned from black to navy blue to sky blue. I was dozing off when I heard loud shouting and a heavy pounding on the front door. Our bedroom door crashed open, and a group of Israeli soldiers brandishing machine guns barged into our room. They ordered us to our feet and demanded our identity cards. I quaked in fear as my four older brothers handed over their documents. The soldiers never asked for mine. They examined my brother's cards, held a clip conversation in Hebrew, and then grabbed Taysir and dragged him out. My mom cried and begged, pleading with the officer not to hurt him. She had heard about the Israeli military torturing Palestinian prisoners. The Israelis called it their break their bones policy. The officer promised that he would take Taysir and just ask him a few questions. Uh, it was only about, it took about a month later before they were even allowed to see him. They didn't ask just a few questions. Uh, he was in prison for eight months. And he was re released from prison, and this is what they found. His body was badly beaten, the result of repeated torture. They didn't just ask him a few questions. They employed their hideous break-their-bones policy on my brother. We rushed Taysir directly to the hospital, but he had massive internal bleeding and liver and spleen failure. There was nothing the surgeons could do to save him. He died after coming out of surgery. My 19-year-old brother Taysir was tortured to death in an Israeli prison for being suspected of throwing rocks at military jeeps. And so you can imagine the effect this would have on uh, Aziz, who's now, I think, 10 years old. Taysir's death enraged me. I was consumed by loss, emptiness, and fury. I spent the rest of my childhood feeling that I had a duty to him to avenge his murder and to fight back against his Israeli oppression. I was determined to avenge my brother's death. I'll just read the last part of this chapter. The dismal life of a Palestinian boy, displaced, disenfranchised, and distressed, is fertile ground for the radicalization of justifiably angry young men. While it is often appropriate to punish wicked deeds, my parents repeatedly, repeatedly reminded me of the higher and more beautiful path, the path of forgiveness, Quran 4240. They were constantly worried that I would seek revenge and end up being killed. They encouraged me to avoid politics. Believers are rep repeatedly encouraged to be forgiving and compassionate people who, according to the Quran, control their rage and pardon other people. My parents would say this repeatedly, but I was not yet in a position to hear. Uh, if you want to hear um, how Aziz went from this to an award-winning peace worker, uh, come back tonight, I think at 7 o'clock, I'll talk more about the book or buy the book, 
there are copies for sale <laughs> out there. I'm selling them below cost for $20. These are the only numbers I'm going to have. I know this is economics, uh, so I thought I'd throw up a little number here, dollars, $20. And for students, I'm going to sell it at half price, which is, I'm going to do a little math here, $10. Okay. I did a Boolean something or other and came up with 10. You can do it differently, but half equals 10. And then uh, that equals, to put it in your language, a mere two slices of pizza in New York. So <laughs> it's simple economics. This book is worth putting in your hands. Uh, I, I will lose money on this book if I sell it for, to you for $10, but I'm, I'm not really after profit. Uh, I'm after really good reviews on Amazon. So take it, write a five-star review on Amazon. You don't even have to read it. Okay, just take it, write a five-star review. Will you do that for me? I'll give you a book if you write a five-star review for me. Uh, and, and it's a bargain. Two slices of pizza. How are we doing for time? Where's my, are you, did you take my phone? Here it is. I got it. She didn't. She did not take my phone. I'm not starting an international incident here. Yeah, I know exactly. It's gone. I wasn't going to say anything. I'm just going to let it play out. Um, you're in that secret military group. Aren't you? You're just infiltrating here today. It's my turn. Yeah. Hey, let me say something about Aziz. You may think that, that Aziz and what I've said so far is, is anti-Jewish or anti-Israel. Aziz started the parent circle. And the parent circle, is that my phone? Oh, you want a student copy. Okay. <laughs> Deal. You're my first king. I'm going to give you one. Um, my, oh yeah. uh, my uh, Aziz started the parent circle, which uh, involves Pal Palestinians and Israelis who have had relatives killed in the conflict. And so if, you, if one of your relatives has died, it doesn't have to be a, a son could be a brother. If you have a relative who was killed in the conflict, you can be in the parent circle. And you don't have to be a parent. Aziz is not a parent, wasn't a parent, and it was his brother. And they, Palestinians and Israelis, they work together in teams, and they go mainly to high schools talking to um, young people about how they can, how Israelis and Jews can live together in Israel in peace. So I, nothing that's written here this is just what happened. These are the people who did it. This was the effect on him. Uh, uh, Aziz also runs uh, a very famous tour company in Israel. Uh, and the tour company he owns with a Jew. And uh, it was featured in Smithsonian Magazine just this August. It's the cover article in Smithsonian Magazine just this August. You can read it online. It's Aziz's tour company that a Palestinian and Jew own together. And they take people all over Israel, and you hear uh, a multi-narrative. You, you, can, you can meet with the most radical. You could meet Benjamin Netanyahu on one of his tours uh, and talk to him. You can meet the president of Palestine on one of his tours. You can meet artists. You can meet um, settlers. You can meet refugees. Um, you will meet lots of people, and you'll, you'll hear lots of different narratives. And the thing that happens is the thing that happens here with my friend from Pakistan. You meet people and you hear their stories and it transforms people's lives. Cover article, Smithsonian Magazine, August of this year is Aziz's tour company. Um, oh, I meant to actually ask one person. I want to leave a little time for questions. My Jewish co-author, uh, Nancy Fuchs Kramer, uh, is she actually retires this year. She was in New York yesterday. Uh, and I said, can you just stay one more day and do this uh, book tour with me? And she's retiring in January, and she didn't want to miss any classes this semester. She teaches in Philadelphia at a, uh, what do you call it? Is it a seminary if it's Jewish? Am I, I could look it up. Anyway, something like that. Um, she's a rabbi, a Reconstructionist rabbi who teaches in a seminary uh, in Philadelphia, but she didn't want to miss her class today, so she didn't stay for this. So uh, we were this close to seeing uh, Nancy, and she's wonderful. She comes to New York quite a bit. She works in a group 
I think it's called Sisters of Sarah or something like that. And I'll tell you why it's Sisters of Sarah uh, in her story here. So she writes this. Uh, so I'm reading chapter one of each, each of these, or parts of it. On my first day of Hebrew school, I fell in love with the Torah, encountering my first Bible stories at the age of nine. I knew I had found a new home, my chosen other world, in which we seek meaning. Although I grew up in a mostly secular setting, early on I had an intention that life was more mysterious than anyone around me was letting on. The men and women in the Torah seemed to know something about that uh, missing dimension for which I yearned. They called it God. I wanted to know more, and I still do. Even on a strictly human level, these biblical stories fascinated me. Out of all the characters in those stories, my favorite was Sarah. Here was a, life, a devoted wife who followed her husband, Abraham, into the unknown, devised a plan for him to have a child through her servant, Hagar, and once becoming a mother herself, ensured a legacy for her son, Isaac. I wanted nothing more than what my idealized Sarah appeared to want, a good husband with a blessed future and, of course, children. Then she writes, remember, this was the 1950s. Uh, uh, she's a pretty serious feminist now. This was, would not be how she would put her goals for her life now. Uh, then she says, for his part, Abraham was the very exemplar of faith, moved only by a call from an unseen God. He left his family and home and ventured to a land that God would show him. Together, this couple represented all that was good about our tradition. Courage, a willing, willingness to journey to, a, to new adventures, and a fierce desire to preserve Jewish identity into the next generation. Abraham was the activist who heard the call and responded. Sarah was the loyal wife who supported him in his every step. Now, and then, then it gets complicated. This is how you hear Bible stories, and then, then you find out things like this. A um, couple examples. Abraham, when he went down to Egypt, I think it was, lied twice about Sarah, saying Sarah was his sister. And um, he did that to protect his butt. He was afraid that if he took his attractive wife Sarah down into Egypt and the king, who evidently had the hots for Sarah, uh, and the king desired her, um, then the king might want to have his way with her. And if it was his wife, he might feel bad about doing it. Maybe he'd have to kill Abraham first uh, to do it. Uh, so he says, oh, it's my sister, no worries. Now, the text doesn't say this. But I think you're supposed to read this in the silence, that the king had his way with Sarah. And I think you're also supposed to read this, maybe that's why Sarah was barren. Uh, when God says uh, that Abraham's going to be the father of, of a multitude, and, um, and it's going to spread out to all the nations, and Abraham's concern, you know, my wife is barren. Maybe, maybe Sarah, and this is, I think you're supposed to read this, if you, if you, if you uh, pay attention to the story, I think you're supposed to think maybe God did that for Sarah's own good, and maybe Abraham's own good, uh, that Sarah was barren. But Abraham let a king sleep with his wife, lied, and let a king sleep with his wa wife, not once, but twice, to save his own butt. And then when he says he's going to be the father of a multitude, of course, he runs right out and has sex with his maidservant, Hagar. And uh, Hagar, of course, is important because Hagar becomes the sort of iconic figure for, um, uh, for Muslims, and Sarah is the iconic figure for Jews. And H Hagar is the one that Abraham picks out. They both trace their, their they tell different stories about uh, Hagar. Um, so there are different traditions that tell different stories about Hagar, but they're important in different ways. But in the Hebrew Bible, in the Torah, the one that she loved, and if you heard the first three paragraphs that I just read, you would think these are great stories. Anyone should follow them. But they're really deeply complicated stories with uh, injustice and lack of faith in them. And, and she slowly learns that. And, and anyone who works in interfaith is going to say this sometime. And after 9-11, her world changed. She did interfaith. If she did interfaith before 9-11, you'd have a Protestant, a Catholic, and a Jew. That was interfaith before 9-11.
Protestant Catholic Jew. After 9-11, the Christians and, and the Protestants and Catholics had to fight it out. They only got one seat at the table because it was going to be Christian, Muslim, Jew after 9-11. Anyone who works in 9-11 knows, at least in the U.S., the interfaith landscape dramatically changed after 9-11. And um, uh, sadly, um, uh, anti-Semitism got a little off the plate. And you can see what happens when we don't pay attention to it, when we forget what happens. Anti-Semitism is on the rise in the United States. Um, I think we maybe last week celebrated South Week. Remember the uh, killings in uh, Pittsburgh at the synagogue uh, about a year ago. Um, most synagogues in the U.S. now, definitely in big cities, but I found out in Grand Rapids, Michigan, too, have to have security, really heavy security. Because if you're going to go to worship in a synagogue in the U.S., you have to understand somebody might want to come in and shoot you. Uh, Grand Rapids was in the newspaper maybe three weeks ago because somebody set up Nazi propaganda posters on the synagogue wall. And they glued him with, like, super glue or something, and they couldn't get him off in time for, for the uh, Saturday school. Uh, and so they had to put posters, bigger posters, over them to hide from the kids coming into the, the school. Uh, so we took our eye off that anti-Semitism has reared its ugly head again. Um, and there's been a lot of focus on Islamophobia. And Nancy has taken it uh, as a Jew to befriend her Hagar story. And Hagar, the story is complicated because um, she, if I remember the story right, she uh, recommends that Abraham have sex with Hagar. Then she gets pregnant later. And here's the key point. They kick Hagar out into the wilderness. And, and that's not as cool as it sounds. Uh, if you are a single mother with a child living in those times, didn't have a man to care for you in those times, didn't have a home, didn't have a farm, didn't have food, you were just set out to wander, I'd say your life expectancy was really low. And um, so Hagar gets kicked out. That's the ugliness of this story. And so she writes in the end. I'll just read what she writes in the end. Uh, as she's come to embrace pagans, uh, Muslims, whom, who she didn't know. By the way, I didn't know a Muslim before 9-11. or I didn't knowingly know a Muslim before 9-11. Now some of my best friends are Muslims. I mean, the world has changed after 9-11. Um, um, there's a poet, Moja Kath. She calls it an extended midrash on the dysfunctional family that we share, and she means we um, Jews and Muslims. We share a dysfunctional family. We, we all like to trace ourselves back to Abraham. We're all Abraham's children, Muslim, Christian, and Jew. Well, trace yourself back. You're going to find some ugliness in that story. Um, and um, Moja, in a poem, constructs uh, a future family reunion out of the blue infinitude that redeems Sarah, Hagar, and even Abraham. And together, this is what he writes, they dismantle the house of fear brick by back-breaking brick. Um, Sarah, and what, so what happens in the poem, Sarah's 12 grandchildren pick up, uh, sorry, Hagar's 12 grandchildren pick up Sarah's 12 grandchildren, and then they have a reunion. And this is the poem. Sorrows furrow every face. This in the firelight, no one denies. No one tries to brush it all away or rushes into glib forgiveness. A Hamas sniper, a Mossad assassin, fall to their knees, rocking. Each one cries. I was only defending my, my into the arms of each. Uh, Hajar and Sarah place a wailing orphaned infant. Slow moaning fills the air. A tone, a tone. And the wailing goes on for ages. And then the family drama sort of plays itself out. And then... There's a, a time now for new stories. Sarah laughs again more deeply. Abraham is radiant. Everyone this time around can recognize in the eyes of every other the flickering light of the divine. And then Nancy writes, may it be so. What do you say after that? 
we need to come together. We need to construct new stories. Um, but they're only stories that we'll construct when we come together. We overcome our fears and come together in compassion and peace. Um, so it's after two. I think I'll stop here. I don't have much more time and see if anyone has any questions or comments.